Good evening. You're looking live at Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, where SpaceX is counting down to liftoff of a Falcon 9 rocket this morning at uh, Kennedy Space Center, where this camera is located. Liftoff time is scheduled for 1.03 a.m. Eastern Time. That is 5.03 a.m. UTC, about one hour and three minutes from now. My name is Stephen Clark. I'm the editor of Space Flight Now. I'll be providing updates and commentary throughout the countdown and the flight of the Falcon 9 rocket this morning. The payload on board consists of 56 Starlink Internet satellites. This will be the 84th SpaceX launch, primarily dedicated to uh, deploying satellites for the Starlink Internet network. And this will be SpaceX's overall 32nd launch of the year and the 16th this year, primarily dedicated to Starlink network capacity additions. So about half of SpaceX's launches so far in 2023 have been with the purpose of continuing to add capacity to the Starlink internet network. We're about 30 minutes or so away from the start of propellant loading on the Falcon 9 rocket. That'll be the next major milestone in the countdown. We'll bring you live views of Pad 40 throughout the countdown this morning, as well as views from SpaceX cameras on board the Falcon 9 as it climbs into space with these 56 Starlink satellites on board. If you're just joining us and you haven't done so yet, please hit the thumbs up or the like button on our YouTube stream. That helps us through the YouTube algorithm attract more viewers to our launch coverage. We want to bring this launch to as many people as possible. It should be a beautiful launch tonight with a mostly clear skies over Florida Space Coast. The weather forecast going into the countdown this morning calls for a 95% chance of acceptable weather conditions and uh, just a low risks uh, of a probability of violating any of the upper level wind constraints for a Falcon 9 launch or violating any of the landing or recovery weather constraints for the return of the first stage, which will be targeting a landing on one of SpaceX's drone ships out in the Atlantic Ocean northeast of the Bahamas. After liftoff, the Falcon 9 will be heading on a trajectory southeast, uh, flying just off the coast of the Bahamas as it arcs uh, out over the Atlantic, targeting an orbit inclined 43 degrees to the equator. We've seen some periodic events from the Strongback out at Pad 40 as SpaceX runs through their pre-tanking checklist. And then at T minus 35 minutes, about 20, a little more than 25 minutes from now is when propellant loading should get underway for the target launch time, which is set for precisely 1.03 and 50 seconds a.m. Eastern time. That is 5.03.50 UTC. And later in the countdown, we also should should get some updates, some audio from SpaceX launch and landing control, and we'll bring that to you on this stream as well. And as the countdown approaches T minus one hour, we hope you enjoy these views of Pad 40, and we'll be back with more updates and more context and background on this mission in a few minutes.
As SpaceX's countdown is approaching or has just passed the T-minus 57-minute mark, we're about 22 minutes away from the start of propellant loading. Here's a look over at Space Launch Complex 41, uh, about a mile and a half north of Pad 40, where the Falcon 9 is going to be launching in less than an hour. At Pad 41, United Launch Alliance has the first flight article for their Vulcan rocket program on the pad. ULA's launch team put this rocket through a tanking test yesterday on uh, Friday night here at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Loaded uh, methane and liquid oxygen into the Vulcan rocket for a countdown rehearsal. And this is in preparation for a, a test firing of the rocket's two Blue Origin built BE-4 engines in the coming days or perhaps in the coming weeks. We're not sure exactly when that's going to be occurring. But the tanking test yesterday was a preparatory step for this test firing of the first stage engines, a hold down firing at pad 41. That's going to be one of the final tests, one of the final milestones before uh, ULA's launch team declares they are ready to proceed into the final stages of the launch campaign for the maiden flight of the Vulcan Centaur rocket, which could be occurring uh, sometime as soon as later this summer. Separately, ULA is investigating an incident that occurred during a test of the upgraded Centaur upper stage, a test article of the upgraded Centaur upper stage that will be flying on the Vulcan rocket. That occurred uh, last month in Alabama at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, there was a hydrogen fire on the test stand that uh, damaged the test stand and the Centaur test article. So in parallel with the testing of the Vulcan flight article here at Cape Canaveral. ULA is investigating that mishap on the test stand with the test article in Alabama. And uh, if that investigation yields a no major, uh, yields a decision that no major modifications or reviews are required for the Vulcan Centaur rocket before its inaugural test launch, ULA could be launching this rocket later this summer from here at Cape Canaveral. That maiden flight of the Vulcan rocket will be carrying a pair of Amazon Kuiper broadband satellites, the first two satellites for Amazon's planned a mega constellation of more than 3,000 internet satellites that will be launched later this decade on a variety of rockets, including the Atlas V, the Vulcan, and the Ariane 6. Uh, numerous missions, uh, dozens of missions, have been booked on each of those launch vehicles for deployment of the Kuiper satellites, the first two of those on board the maiden flight of the Vulcan. Also on board the first flight of Vulcan will be the Astrobotic Peregrine Moon Lander, a commercial lunar landing, landing craft that will be going to the moon carrying a suite of payloads and experiments on behalf of NASA. But before that can occur, before those payloads are actually mated to the top of the Vulcan Centaur rocket, still one major test to go. That's the test firing of the first stages uh, BE-4 engines produced by Blue Origin. This will be the first time these BE-4 engines fueled by methane will be flying. So they want to make sure those engines work well on the, on the launch pad and also make sure uh, that those engines and the various ground systems at the launch pad are all in uh, tip-top shape before proceeding into the final stages of the launch campaign and a countdown and potentially the liftoff of the first Vulcan rocket in the coming months. Here's a look back at Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station where you see the Falcon 9, 229 feet or 70 meters in height standing ready for liftoff in 52 minutes and 42 seconds.
Out at Space Launch Complex 41, the Falcon 9 rocket stands at 229 feet or about 70 meters in height. It's a two-stage launch vehicle. The first stage of the Falcon 9 is powered by nine Merlin 1D engines. Each of these engines burns a mixture of rocket-grade kerosene, also known as Rocket Propellant 1 or RP-1, with liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. The first stage has four landing legs that will deploy on a descent back toward the drone ship that SpaceX has parked out in the Atlantic Ocean. The nine Merlin engines will generate about 1.7 million pounds of thrust at full power. This booster is designated Booster 1067. It's going for its 11th flight to space after debuting and joining SpaceX's fleet of reusable rocket boosters back in June of 2021. If you notice the first stage, uh, it is a bit darker, quite a bit darker than the first stage in the payload fairing. Uh, those are uh, soot and scorch markings from left deposited on the first stage from its previous 10 flights to space. And uh, it'll add a little bit more marking to that booster tonight with an, an 11th flight on tap with another launch and landing on this mission, Starlink 5-9. Above the first stage is the carbon interstage adapter that will actually come back to Earth with the first stage. There are four uh, titanium grid fins uh, uh, around the circumference of that interstage. Those will provide some steering and stability during the booster's descent back into the atmosphere. If you really think about it, that booster is basically uh, a 15-story tall structure with no wings uh, flying back into the atmosphere. Uh, those little small grid fins, though, do at the very top of the booster do provide some steering uh, authority and stability as the first stage engines relight to actually slow down for landing. Inside the interstage adapter is the Merlin vacuum engine nozzle for the upper stage. The upper stage has one engine. That Merlin vacuum engine will generate more than 200,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. It has a large expansion nozzle for increased efficiency and higher thrust in the vacuum of space. The first stage, or the second stage rather, is the only major part of the rocket that is not recoverable and reusable. The second stage, once it's completed its mission, after deploying the uh, 56 Starlink satellites, will perform a deorbit burn with that engine to uh, guide it back into the atmosphere and burn up over a remote part of the ocean. The uh, upper stage still has the same propellant mixture as the first stage, kerosene and liquid oxygen. Above the upper stage is the payload fairing. It's about 5.2 meters or 17 feet in diameter, about 43 feet or 17 meters tall. And inside that clamshell fairing are the 56 Starlink satellites going to space on tonight's mission. The fairing, each half of that fairing will be jettisoned from the rocket about three minutes after liftoff and they will use the parachutes to slow themselves down for splashdown in the Atlantic. And SpaceX has another recovery boat, a separate team, out uh, a little bit farther downrange than the drone ship for the booster recovery to retrieve each of those fairing halves and bring them back to Port Canaveral for inspection, refurbishment, and reflight. Those fairings uh, are also reusable. Each of those fairing halves, or a set of fairing halves, Brand new cost about $6 million, so SpaceX uh, wants to recover and reuse those wherever possible. We're now about 45 minutes and 30 seconds from the target liftoff time, about 10 minutes away from the beginning of propellant loading.
SpaceX has three distinct launch opportunities this morning for this mission, which is uh, named or numbered Starlink 5-9 in SpaceX's launch sequence. The first of those, the launch time currently being targeted, is at 1.03 and 50 seconds a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That is 5.03.50 UTC. If there is any uh, weather concern or any technical concern or if preparations are just simply running behind schedule, SpaceX's team has a couple of other opportunities later this morning at 2.44 a.m. Eastern Time and at 4.25 a.m. Eastern Time. We have those listed here on this slide. So those are the two backup launch opportunities. And then if uh, SpaceX uh, can't get this mission off the ground this morning, there's another series of launch opportunities available uh, early Monday morning, beginning at 12.38 a.m. Eastern Time. So these are the Three launch opportunities available this morning. Each of these are instantaneous. So we can launch at 103, 244, or 425. Right now, the team is targeting 103. We hope to hear some uh, audio from SpaceX launch control in the next few minutes uh, to confirm uh, the poll, which should be underway soon, of the uh, launch team of the engineers stationed in the control center for their readiness and their go to proceed into propellant loading and to proceed for the first of these launch opportunities in 43 minutes time. If you're just joining us, my name is Stephen Clark. I'm the editor of Space Flight Now. We want to welcome you to our live coverage of SpaceX's 32nd launch of the year, the 23rd launch of the year overall from Cape Canaveral and from Kennedy Space Center. This launch is from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Our camera is about four miles away looking out at pad 40. The Falcon 9 is positioned in between those uh, four towers. Those are lightning protection towers with the flashing hazard lights. Those uh, towers there are uh, designed to attract uh, lightning away from the Falcon 9 rocket during uh, thunderstorms when the launch vehicle is vertical. There are no thunderstorms in the immediate vicinity this morning. We're now about seven minutes away from the start of propellant loading. We should be hearing, hopefully, some words from SpaceX Launch Control in a couple of minutes. If you haven't done so yet, please hit the thumbs up or the like button on our YouTube stream. That really helps us out a lot to attract a, a larger audience and more viewers to our coverage of this overnight launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida. So you can do that by hitting the thumbs up or the like button just under our video stream.
on countdown net. Polling is complete. At this time, we are go for propellant load and launch. And SpaceX's launch team just gave the go for propellant loading and launch. So the SpaceX engineers at the Launch and Landing Control Center just a few miles south of the pad, just outside the gate to Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, those team members have been polled, and they're all go for propellant loading and launch. So the team will be targeting the first of the three launch opportunities this morning that is scheduled for 1.03 a.m. and 50 seconds, 1.03.50 Eastern okay, Daylight Time. For abort instructions for non-urgent, no-go conditions, brief CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown for urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation. Operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed to launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Thanks, sir. Venting for propellant load. That was the SpaceX launch director briefing his team uh, for the procedures they will need to follow in the event of any abort during the countdown, because at uh, 35 minutes, at the same time propellant loading begins, the control of the countdown will be handed over to an automated ground computer that will oversee the series of steps to configure the Falcon 9 for launch, including the all-important loading of fuel and oxidizer. At T-minus 60 seconds, control of the countdown will be passed from the ground computer to the flight computer on the actual rocket itself. The launch auto has started.
T minus 32 minutes until launch of SpaceX's Starlink 5 9 mission on board a Falcon 9 rocket. You're looking live at Space Launch Complex 40. We heard a call about three minutes ago that propellant loading has gotten underway. This begins with uh, pumping kerosene and liquid oxygen into the first stage of the Falcon 9, as well as kerosene into the second stage. The liquid oxygen on stage two won't be loaded aboard until about T minus 16 minutes. That's the final tank to be filled in the countdown. Countdown is now also under the control of the uh, sequencer computer. This is a ground computer that man manages the really countless numbers of steps, uh, uh, software checks, valves opening and closing, testing, all of these milestones that have to occur uh, to ready and make sure the Falcon 9 is configured for its launch at 1.03 a.m. Eastern Time, 5.03 a.m. UTC. If you look closely at our view of pad 40 of the Falcon 9, you can see some of the vapors and frost and condensation now apparent around the first stage of the rocket. The liquid oxygen tank starts about a third of the way up that first stage booster with that charcoal gray soot scorch color on its outer skin. That liquid oxygen is chilled down to a few hundred degrees below zero. It's very cold, and that causes uh, some frost and ice to build up on the outside of that tank as it is filled up during the countdown. So over the next few minutes, if you watch this view, you can see the frost level actually rise up the first stage as the tank is filled up. Below that liquid oxygen tank, at the very bottom of the booster stage, is the RP-1, or kerosene tank. The kerosene is stored at uh, temperature is much closer to room temperature, so you don't see that frost and ice build up as the kerosene is loaded aboard. This mission is carrying a batch of 56 Starlink internet satellites. This view is a SpaceX photo from a previous mission, but most of these satellites are virtually identical in appearance. So this is uh, pretty much the way these 56 satellites look like as they're encapsulated inside the payload fairing of the Falcon 9. They're flat packed one on top of the other and held down to the upper stage to the payload adapter ring using a uh, set of four metallic retention rods. These retention rods actually jettison from the rocket. And uh, at the time of payload deployment, about an hour and five minutes after liftoff in the case of this mission, that will allow the 56 satellites to fly free from the upper stage of the Falcon 9. The upper stage actually enters a spin maneuver uh, during the final minutes before payload deployment. That allows, uh, those forces allow the 56 satellites to fly off the rocket and then begin separating from one another like a deck of cards thanks to those uh, centrifugal forces imparted by the upper stage. And then those satellites will actually deploy their power generating solar panels. They'll activate various systems, eventually including their ion propulsion systems for maneuvers to uh, climb up to their operating altitude and begin providing internet service. As I mentioned, there are 56 Starlink satellites on board. Each of these satellites are of the older generation, version 1.5 satellites, as they're known. Each of these satellites weighs about uh, 300 kilograms or 660 pounds on the launch pad and launch configuration. They're solar-powered spacecraft with krypton-fueled ion engines for in-orbit maneuvers. SpaceX builds these satellites on an assembly line up in Redmond, Washington, a suburb of Seattle. 
and these satellites will be deployed in an orbit about 200 miles, 300 kilometers in altitude. Eventually, they'll use their own propulsion systems to climb to their operating orbit at 329 miles or 530 kilometers at an inclination of 43 degrees to the equator. These satellites are the version 1.5 satellites. They're not the new uh, version 2 mini satellites that are much larger. However, these satellites will be going into SpaceX's Gen 2, or second generation constellation. Uh, the difference between the first generation and second generation constellation is largely regulatory. It actually is a different orbital plane that these satellites will be deployed into compared to the first generation constellation, which SpaceX has nearly completed uh, populating at this point. Just a few more launches to go uh, until that first generation constellation is full. These satellites uh, will be deployed in, again at the orbit of 43 degrees to the equator, whereas the first generation satellites in the first generation constellation, I should say, uh, deploy into different inclinations, 53, 70, and 97 degrees uh, roughly are the inclinations for Gen 1. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the version 1.5 satellites that we're seeing launching this morning by SpaceX. On the right is a photo taken earlier this year of the first batch of the much larger, uh, really uh, about four times the mass of the version 1.5 satellites. These are the version 2 mini satellites. You can fit nearly 60 Starlink version 1.5s on a Falcon 9. On a Falcon 9, you can only fit about 21 version 2 mini satellites. The first two launches with these uh, upgraded satellites, which have four times the capacity for internet service, uh, occurred in February. There was another launch last month with more of these version 2 mini satellites. And the next Starlink launch uh, planned by SpaceX uh, later uh, next week, on uh, no earlier than May the 19th, the next launch from Pad 40 here at Cape Canaveral, will be carrying another batch of the version 2 mini satellites into orbit. The version 2 mini name is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, there are actually miniature versions of the even larger and more powerful full-size version 2 satellites for the Starlink network that SpaceX plans to eventually launch on its new Starship mega rocket uh, once that rocket uh, is able to complete its test program and prove it can reach orbit. On the ground side, here's a look at what a user terminal looks like. This is a square uh, antenna, phased array antenna, that uh, SpaceX ships out to consumers who sign up for Starlink service. You place this uh, in an area with an open view of the sky, and it automatically receives and transmits signals to satellites as they pass overhead in low Earth orbit. Back to a full screen view of Pad 40, you can see that frost line slowly creeping up the first stage booster. That liquid oxygen tank looks to be about a third, maybe 40% full at this point, not quite half full. Liquid oxygen will continue to load into the rocket all the way down until T minus two minutes to make sure those tanks are fully topped up and to replace any of the liquid oxygen that boils off in the warm ambient Florida atmosphere. If you're just joining us, my name is Stephen Clark. I'm the editor of Space Flight Now, providing launch updates and commentary for SpaceX's 32nd launch of the year. If you haven't done so yet, please hit the thumbs up or the like button on our YouTube stream. That helps us out a lot by attracting more viewers through the YouTube algorithm as we now enter the final 23 minutes until liftoff.
now 20 minutes, 40 seconds until liftoff. And there is the big vent from the strong back at pad 40. This occurs around the end of loading of kerosene into the upper stage. We should hear that call shortly, hopefully from SpaceX launch control, that RP-1 load. There's the call. RP-1 load or kerosene fueling of the second stage is complete. This vent coincides with the start of chill down or thermal conditioning of the upper stage with uh, in preparation for its loading of liquid oxygen. The liquid oxygen, as I mentioned earlier in our coverage, very cold. It's cryogenic chilled down to a few hundred degrees below zero. And uh, in preparation for loading liquid oxygen from the ground storage tank out of the pad, it has to run up a line on that strong back structure just to the right of the rocket and then into the umbilical into the second stage tank. That whole line has to be chilled down or thermally conditioned before uh, the full flow of liquid oxygen can safely go into the upper stage uh, without risking any, any risk of uh, damage or thermal shock to the hardware and various components of that system. So that chill down now underway. We're about three minutes away from when that chill down will be complete. And then liquid oxygen can begin flowing into the second stage. We should uh, see that big vent, that's a gaseous oxygen vent, terminate in less than 30 seconds or so. That will be uh, marking the start of liquid oxygen loading onto the second stage of the Falcon 9. And that vent is now terminated. We'll stand by for the liquid oxygen loading call for the second stage. Stage two lock load has started. And liquid oxygen now is flowing into the second stage of the Falcon 9. This is the final propellant tank to be loaded this morning. So all four propellant tanks are either loaded or currently being filled with propellant. In parallel with propellant loading, uh, SpaceX is also flowing high pressure helium into the Falcon 9. This helium is used to maintain pressure inside the rocket as the propellants, the fuel and oxidizer are consumed in flight.
T minutes, 30 seconds until liftoff. The Falcon 9 stands 229 or about 70, 229 feet or about 70 meters tall. The first stage is powered by nine Merlin 1D engines. These engines burn kerosene and liquid oxygen as propellants. And this cluster of nine engines will generate 1.7 million pounds of thrust at full power. The first stage on this mission is going for its 11th flight. Above the first stage is the carbon interstage adapter. This uh, carbon structure will actually come back to Earth with the first stage of the Falcon 9. It has the four aerodynamic uh, steering or stability fins. These grid fins are used to help but control the rocket during its descent for landing. Inside the carbon interstage, inside that uh, volume, is the expansion nozzle for the Merlin 1D engine on stage 2. The second stage is the only part of the Falcon 9 that isn't reusable. It has a single engine uh, that burns kerosene and liquid oxygen as well. This engine will produce more than 200,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. The upper stage will be deorbited after its job is complete on this mission, uh, more than an hour after liftoff, to burn up in the atmosphere. Above the second stage, on top of the Falcon 9, is the payload fairing 17 feet or uh, 17 meters or about 43 feet tall. Inside that fairing are the 56 Starlink satellites going to space to join SpaceX's internet network this morning. This payload fairing, these two shells that comprise the nose cone, will be returning to Earth under parachute for splashdown and recovery. Now, 12 minutes, 45 seconds remaining until launch of SpaceX's Falcon 9 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. If you haven't done so yet, one more appeal to hit the thumbs up or the like button on our YouTube stream that helps us attract more viewers. We want to get as many people watching uh, this launch as possible. That helps us uh, bring our coverage to a, as wide of, a, of an audience as we can. You can help us do that by hitting the thumbs up or the like button. Also, if you want to get uh, alerts when we're going live with launch coverage so you don't miss a launch in the future, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. We uh, always go live for every launch here at Cape Canaveral and you'll get uh, alerts if you hit the subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. As SpaceX's countdown is at 11 minutes, 30 seconds, here's a look at the rate of launches here on the eastern range of Florida. Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and Kennedy Space Center launches combined on this chart. This is the 23rd orbital launch attempt of the year from Florida Space Coast. You can see on the far right, that's the 2023 bar. 23 or 22 in the books, 23 tonight. Uh, all but one of those missions this year have been performed by SpaceX. The other one was by Relativity Space, a, a test flight of their Terran 1, an orbital launch attempt uh, that did not successfully reach orbit. Last year, there were 57 launches from Florida Space Coast. The pace this year is for a similar or slightly bigger number. Uh, that's the plan, at least, if uh, everything goes according to schedule. Here's a look at the launch countdown timeline. We've passed a few of these milestones already. Fueling of the Falcon 9 began at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, the next step was liquid oxygen loading, which began at 16 minutes prior to launch a few minutes ago. And then uh, the next big event will be the start of engine chill down. This is the thermal conditioning of the nine Merlin engines on the first stage, beginning at T minus seven minutes. At six minutes, we expect to hear a call that kerosene or RP-1 load, the fueling load on the first stage is complete. And then liquid oxygen load will continue down until uh, T minus two minutes. At four and a half minutes, the strongback, the uh, 
structure just to the right of the Falcon 9 rocket in this view. It'll recline to an angle of about one and a half degrees from the vehicle. It'll stay there for the rest of the countdown and then begin a more rapid motion away from the rocket to clear the way for liftoff at T0. Control of the countdown will be passed from the ground computer, currently overseeing the countdown steps to the Falcon 9's onboard computer at T minus one minute. At that point, propellant tank pressurization will begin. And then at 45 seconds, SpaceX's launch director will verify he is go for liftoff. The engine start command will begin at T minus three seconds. You may see a green flash underneath the first stage. That's from TTEB, uh, triethyl aluminum, triethyl borane. This is the igniter fluid that gives off a very brief but very distinctive on nights with good visibility, a green flash before the orange glow of the engines themselves actually overtakes that, takes that green color. And then a few seconds later, hold down clamps will release to allow the Falcon 9 to begin its ascent. Here's a look at the trajectory for this mission. The Falcon 9 will be heading off to the southeast from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. We've labeled here the location of Space Launch Complex 40, the departure point this morning. And you can see the red line shows the path that the first stage booster will take targeting landing on the drone ship named Just Read the Instructions, about 410 miles or 660 kilometers southeast of the Cape. The green line shows the path that the upper stage with the 56 Starlink satellites on board will take after uh, separation of the stages, about two and a half minutes into the flight. That upper stage will actually vector its thrust slightly to make a more uh, southerly, a right-hand turn to steer around the northernmost Bahamas and then head out to northeast of the Turks and Caicos and then east of Puerto Rico over the Caribbean Sea and eventually into orbit. Here's a look at the uh, launch timeline. This mission will last about an hour and five minutes from the time of liftoff until SpaceX can confirm the deployment of the 56 Starlink satellites. Most of the action takes place in the first uh, nine minutes. That will include uh, liftoff, uh, supersonic speed, and then stage separation at two and a half minutes into the flight. The second stage engine will light a few moments later. Uh, for a six-minute burn to uh, reach a preliminary parking orbit. Meanwhile, the first stage will uh, flip uh, into a tail-first orientation. It'll relight its uh, three of its nine engines for an entry burn about six minutes into the flight. And then its center engine, just the uh, one engine of the nine, will ignite for a final, a final braking maneuver uh, for a uh, touchdown, a vertical propulsive landing on the drone ship about eight and a half minutes into the flight. Meanwhile, uh, after that, the second stage will coast halfway around the world before relighting for a very short two-second maneuver to maneuver uh, the rocket into a higher, more circular orbit. That's the proper orbit, the right altitude, the right inclination for spacecraft separation. We heard the call uh, about 40 seconds ago for the start of engine chill down. This is a thermal conditioning procedure used to make sure uh, the plumbing in the engine section of the Falcon 9's first stage is all at the right temperature for ignition. And right now we just heard that the first stage uh, kerosene tank has been filled. So about 46,000 gallons of kerosene or rocket grade uh, hydrocarbon has been loaded into both stages of the Falcon 9. Liquid oxygen loading will continue for another three and a half minutes. Are pressing for somebody retract. Countdown has passed T minus five minutes. The next step will be the retraction of the strong back at pad 40. We should see that motion 
shortly. If you look closely, you can see that structure and just recline ever so slightly from the Falcon 9. This process begins with the opening of clamps at the top of the rocket that reach around the second stage. With those clamps open, the Stromback is free to retract. Stromback retract is started. Now inside of four minutes until liftoff. The first stage of the Falcon 9 for this mission, Booster 1067, has flown to space and back 10 times before. It has launched uh, a crew to the International Space Station back in 2021, another crew to the ISS in April of 2022. It's also launched uh, two cargo missions to the ISS and a number of commercial missions, including several Starlink flights in its uh flight history. Its most recent launch was on March the 24th of this year. This is the orbital parameters being targeted for this mission. 185 by 211 miles is the orbit that the satellites should be deployed in about an hour and five minutes into the flight at an inclination of 43 degrees to the equator. Back full screen at pad 40, you can see the Strongback has retracted into its uh, pre-launch, final pre-launch position, about one and a half degrees from the rocket. Now two minutes, 40 seconds to go. Minutes, two minutes and counting. Everything looking good for liftoff at 1.03 a.m. Eastern Time, 5.03 a.m. UTC. Minute, 40 seconds. At uh, T-minus one minute, control of the countdown will be handed over from the ground computer to the, to the flight computer. And 90 seconds to go. We just heard the call from SpaceX launch control that the liquid oxygen loading is now complete on both stages. Ground gas closeouts. SpaceX has a fully loaded 1.2 million pound Falcon 9 rocket, about a minute and 12 seconds from launching from Cape Canaveral. Minus 60 seconds. Control of the countdown is handed over now from the ground computer to the flight computer. Falcon 9, Falcon 9 is now in startup. It is controlling the countdown. Should hear a call from the launch director on a final go for launch momentarily. SpaceX go for launch. And SpaceX's launch director has given her final go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. The engine startup sequence will begin at T minus three seconds with the igniter fluid T-TEB. Triethyl aluminum, triethyl bore range should give a brief green flash uh, before the engine ignition actually occurs. T minus 10 seconds will stand by for engine ignition. There's engine start and liftoff. Liftoff of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket with 56 more Starlink Internet satellites heading to orbit. T plus 15 seconds, Falcon 9 is now climbing away from pad 40. 
It's now pitching downrange, heading to the southeast. Let's listen to the roar from the nine Merlin engines. plus one minute. Falcon 9 now has surpassed the speed of sound. Climbing through some uh, thin cloud cover and has now reached max Q, maximum aerodynamic pressure now on the vehicle as the Falcon 9 rockets into the stratosphere with 56 Starlink satellites on their way to orbit. One minute, 45 seconds into the flight. Everything looking good. No reports of any issues so far on the 234th flight of a Falcon rocket. That includes Falcon 1s, Falcon 9s, and Falcon heavies. Two minutes since liftoff. Now less than 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff. That'll be followed by... Stage separation a few moments later, and then shortly thereafter, second stage ignition. We have main engine cutoff, visual confirmation of engine shutdown. Looks like we've had staging and ignition of the second stage the second stage Merlin vacuum engine has ignited and is producing more than 200,000 pounds of thrust to continue the acceleration to orbital velocity. Falcon 9 currently, the upper stage currently, is at uh, 8,200 kilometers per hour at an altitude of 85 kilometers. We're going to switch over to SpaceX now. Uh, we heard confirmation a moment ago that the payload fairing on the uh, upper stage has jettison. Those two fairing has will be coming back to Earth, just like the first stage for recovery and reuse. On the right-hand side of the split screen from SpaceX's video feed is the red-hot engine nozzle from the Merlin vacuum engine. Now firing for its first of three burns on this mission, the first two to place the 56 Starlink satellites into the proper orbit, and then a third burn uh, later on this morning for a deorbit maneuver to bring the rocket back into the atmosphere for disposal. This video feed from SpaceX does come with uh, some delay. About 15 seconds or so of delay. Uh, this latency uh, is often what we see with the SpaceX uh, rocket cam and live video feeds on YouTube. Now more than four minutes since liftoff, no problems reported so far on this Starlink 5-9 mission. The rocket now has accelerated uh, beyond 10,000 kilometers per hour. That's about 6,000 miles per hour. Here's a, a switch back to our live camera view from Kennedy Space Center. Still can see the upper stage engine uh, faintly glowing as it heads downrange out over the Atlantic Ocean. SpaceX reports the vehicle is on a nominal trajectory and the rocket is now passed within range of a downrange tracking station in Bermuda. If you hear some uh, faint noise on our stream, it's actually... Uh, an alligator that is uh, 
near our camera position at the Kennedy Space Center. We sometimes hear gators and see signs of other wildlife uh, at the Kennedy Space Center, which shares land with a national wildlife refuge. Five minutes, 30 seconds since liftoff. We're now about 15 seconds away from the expected time of the entry burn on the first stage. That entry burn will be uh, using three of the nine engines for a braking maneuver to slow down as the rocket descends further into the atmosphere for landing. We haven't seen any views from the upper stage in a couple of minutes, so we hope to get some video feeds for this entry burn. And now we're seeing it on the left-hand side of your screen. burn now underway three engines firing on the first stage you can see the velocity on the lower left uh, decreasing rapidly with this maneuver as the vehicle the booster is now at 50 kilometers or 30 miles and descending the entry burn is now complete great view here of the heat loads and plasma building up around the a grid fins as it descends deeper into the atmosphere. This is a uh, very dynamic part of the flight as the first stage uh, descends toward the drone ship at uh, supersonic speed. First stage now at 1,500 kilometers per hour and decreasing velocity. It is now passed below the speed of sound. Meanwhile, the upper stage is nearing orbital, orbital velocity. About a minute remaining now until first stage landing and the engine shutdown on stage two. Two critical events occurring right after another. First stage booster now at about 10,000 feet and descending. Eight minutes, eight minutes since launch. And now the first stage landing burn is underway. We're seeing it on the left-hand side of your screen here. These views coming from SpaceX cameras. There's the drone ship in view, standing by for landing leg deployment and landing. And landing confirmed. Booster 1067 is on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. About 400 miles, 410 miles, or 660 kilometers southeast of the Cape. The Falcon 9 first stage covered that distance in about eight and a half minutes. This completes this booster's 11th flight. And we just saw engine shutdown on stage two. The rocket should now be in orbit. And SpaceX has just confirmed uh, with a voice call out from launch control that they've had a nominal orbital insertion. So this means the Falcon 9 is in its expected parking orbit. This is a, a very low altitude uh, elliptical orbit that the rocket will be flying in for another 50 or 45 minutes or so before a very brief two second restart at T plus 54 minutes. That will reshape the orbit into a slightly higher altitude and a more circular orbit for payload separation. Those 56 Starlink satellites will be deployed from the rocket about uh, an hour, about 55 minutes from now, about an hour and five minutes after liftoff.
Here's a live shot of the empty launch pad at uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Launch Complex 40 here. The Falcon 9 lifted off 10 minutes, 30 seconds ago at precisely 1.03.30 Eastern Time. That was 5.03.30 a.m. UTC. This is about a 20-second adjustment from the original target launch time. We're not sure why that occurred, but sometimes uh, based on uh, traffic in orbit, uh, any orbital debris or other spacecraft that could be in the rocket's flight path, those times can be adjusted slightly in the final phase of the countdown. And it looks like SpaceX did that today. So the launch was actually at 103.30 a.m. Eastern Time or 5.03.30 UTC. Now, 14 minutes, 24 seconds since liftoff. The Falcon 9 continues its uh, flight through space now, passing off the northeastern shores of South America. It will soon swing over the north northeasternmost part of Brazil and then head over the South Atlantic Ocean, south of South Africa. And then uh, it will relight its single Merlin vacuum engine on the upper stage in about 40 minutes from now over the Indian Ocean, followed about 10 minutes after that, about uh, 50 minutes from now, by spacecraft separation of these 56 Starlink satellites. This was the 223rd launch of a Falcon 9 rocket since its debut and its first iteration back in 2010. This was the 234th launch overall, 
of the Falcon rocket family, including Falcon 1s, Falcon 9s, and the heavy lift Falcon Heavy. This was the 11th flight of this particular booster that we saw land on the drone ship successfully, Booster 1067. This was the 189th SpaceX launch from here in Florida, the 124th SpaceX launch from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, 179th launch overall from this launch complex uh, that uh, had its uh, life begin in 1965 with uh, launches of the Titan rocket program. This was the 165th flight of those uh, flights that I listed before to utilize a reused or previously flown booster. This marked the 191st uh, successful landing of a Falcon booster overall, including Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions. Falcon Heavy, of course, has three boosters, uh, two of which are usually recovered and reused. This was the 84th SpaceX launch, primarily dedicated to uh, launching satellites for the Starlink Internet Network. This was the 32nd SpaceX launch of the year, including Falcon 9, Falcon Heavies, and the Starship test flight that occurred from South Texas last month. And this was the 23rd orbital launch attempt of the year from Cape Canaveral uh, so far in 2023. Now, 16 minutes, 50 seconds since launch of the Starlink 5-9 mission. You can see these uh, at this map from SpaceX. You can see the very top of the globe is the location of Stage 1, now stationary on the drone ship after its suborbital flight downrange. Uh, it's now been landed and recovered and will be brought back to Port Canaveral in the next couple of days for inspections, refurbishment, and reuse. The second stage, meanwhile, continues in orbit, now flying over the Brazilian coast. Before we sign off our, our coverage here on our dedicated uh, stream for this particular launch, we want to take a look at the launch schedule over the next few days, as we always do at the end of our coverage, give you an idea of what to expect uh, over the next week or two. SpaceX is filling up this launch manifest right now. Uh, they have the next four missions uh, that are currently scheduled to launch, or orbital space missions scheduled to launch around the world, all are SpaceX missions, uh, beginning uh, with a pair of Falcon 9 launches scheduled for Friday, May the 19th. One of those will be originating from the same pad we covered tonight at Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, the Starlink 6-3 mission, a group of uh, upgraded uh, second-generation Starlink satellites different in, uh, different in size and different in performance than the ones we saw launched this morning. That launch is scheduled uh, sometime just after midnight, roughly 12.15 uh, a.m., 12.10 a.m. Eastern Time. That's a little after 4 a.m. UTC on Friday, May the 19th. Around eight hours later, SpaceX will be launching another Falcon 9 rocket from California, from Vandenberg Space Force Base, Space Launch Complex 4 East. This mission will be carrying a cluster of satellites for OneWeb, which has its own broadband mega constellation, and for Iridium, which has a smaller fleet of uh, voice and data relay satellites. These are carrying spare satellites for both of these companies. Uh, 16 uh, OneWeb satellites will be on this mission as well as uh, five Iridium satellites are on this mission. That launch is scheduled from Vandenberg Space Force Base next Friday uh, before dawn local time out in California. And then uh, next Sunday, a week from today, May the 21st, the next crewed mission with SpaceX is scheduled to lift off from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. This mission is scheduled uh, to lift off at 5.37 p.m., Eastern Time, that's 2137 UTC from uh, Pad 39A. Here's a look live at Pad 39A where uh, SpaceX is reconfiguring uh, ground infrastructure uh, from the previous launch from this pad, which was back on April the 30th, a Falcon Heavy launch with three powerful first stage cores. They have to do some reconfiguration of the Strongback the reaction frame structure at pad 39A uh, to convert it back to a single stick, a so-called Falcon 9 with just one first stage for this upcoming crew mission. 
We'll be covering this launch live, of course, and you can watch views of Pad 39A uh, 24 7 on our launch pad live stream. This crewed mission will be heading to the International Space Station with uh, veteran astronaut Peggy Whitson as commander. She's a retired NASA astronaut, now works for the company Axiom Space, which has arranged this uh, commercial space flight mission with a paying customer, John uh, Schaffner, a uh, business entrepreneur and uh, race car driver, as pilot, and then two astronauts uh, sponsored by the government of Saudi Arabia also on this mission to the International Space Station. They'll spend about a week or maybe eight days on board the ISS after flying on a Crew Dragon spacecraft up to the station before returning to Earth for a splashdown in late May off the coast of Florida. And then following that, another Falcon 9 from Pad 40 uh, in late May, with a date unspecified right now, is scheduled to launch the Badr 8, a Saudi Arabian communications satellite. So here's a look at the launch calendar, a busy slate of SpaceX launches uh, for the rest of the month, and then more missions uh, scheduled uh, at the very end of May and into June as well that we can't fit here on this slide. But uh, SpaceX is uh, going for as many as 100 launches this year. Right now they're on the pace for between 80 and 90 uh, if they maintain their current launch cadence for the rest of the year. Last year, they had 61 missions, so clearly on a pace to exceed that in 2023. We're going to sign off our live coverage uh, now uh, on this dedicated stream. And we invite you to switch over to Launchpad Live, where we'll have uh, continuing coverage of the rest of the mission. We'll have mission audio from SpaceX Launch Control on our Launchpad Live stream as they confirm uh, the final steps in uh, this morning's mission, such as the uh, second burn by the upper stage and then payload deployment of the 56 Starlink satellites. And we'll now sign off our dedicated stream. Please switch over to Launchpad Live if you're interested in following the completion of the mission before uh, SpaceX can officially declare this launch a success. Well, thanks for joining us. My name is Stephen Clark, editor of Space Flight Now. I want to thank uh, my colleague Stephen Young for uh, video production and camera operation support this morning uh, at Kennedy Space Center. We'll see you next time. Our next uh, live event uh, for launch coverage on our YouTube channel will be on Friday, May the 19th, with another Starlink mission from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Be sure to check our launch schedule on our website at www.spaceflightnow.com for any changes to that schedule over the next few days. Until then, have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you soon.